as you know, it started in San Francisco. Tom Donahue. Uh, that was the template. If people had listened to what AM and FM radio sounded like before the Donahue experience began, they would have heard on their FM dials extremely bland programming. Stuff that didn't seem to move anybody in any direction. And suddenly we started hearing the sounds that were coming from San Francisco. And the sounds were everybody from the Grateful Dead to the Electric Prunes to every one of those groups that uh, all of you can probably remember. And then we heard something intriguing. We heard disc jockeys or talk show people talking our language. They sounded like us. They didn't sound like radio announcers. And they were talking about the music as if they had just returned from a concert and were explaining to a friend what the experience was like. And when they went to news, on those rare occasions when they went to news, they were talking about stories that we didn't see on Walter Cronkite. When they talked about the weather, they didn't. No sports, no baseball, no hype. And quite interestingly, whenever there was a break for a commercial, the things that they were advertising on the radio suddenly appeared different and were being presented in a different manner. FM radio began to sound more like you were having a conversation or an interaction with somebody you knew. And that had never happened before. In those days, if you turned on a popular uh, AM radio station, uh, in Los Angeles it might be KHJ, in New York it may have been WABC, uh, you would have heard very fast-talking DJs uh, rolling along at uh, amphetamine-driven speed, it would seem, uh, and going into a series of sing singular popular records at the time, uh, two and a half minutes uh, long. Um, a carryover to some degree of 50s music. And they would be speaking the language that A.M. Jock spoke to about that time. It's 14 minutes after the hour of 8 o'clock in Los Angeles, 72 degrees outside. Uh, coming up next, we've got Jerry and the Pacemakers. Well, it was fine, I guess, you know. And um, they always talked with a smile. Because apparently, when you do smile and you talk on the radio, you have a certain kind of AM sound that at the time uh, was what you were supposed to do. And you weren't supposed to do much more than that. Intro, outro, a commercial, sell them something, and here comes the next hit. Conversely, on FM, they may have talked to you as if you would meet somebody on the street who would um, describe an experience they had share the experience with you. And it wasn't just a 10 second sound bite. The disc jockey could have spoken for five or 10 minutes. He could have talked about attending a concert with his girlfriend. And by the way, what he and his girlfriend did after the concert. We got to know these people, their families, their friends, their tastes. And then he would play music, or she would play music. And it wasn't two and a half minutes long. We learned the meaning of a segue. A segue, of course, is when one song is ending and another song is beginning. Which, by the way, is what uh, you hear today uh, in contemporary uh, nightclubs for today's generation. But there were no segues before they were introduced in underground radio. And it wasn't two minutes, it could be an entire album. And it didn't have to be sequentially accurate, it could be from a rock track into a, a Ravi Shankar 
piece, come out of that with a vocalist, a hit of classical music, people breathing. It was a mind movie. It was no longer about halting an experience. It was about living through an audio experience. I went on to KPFK. I was 21 years old. I think I stayed there for two years. I did a, a nightly radio show. I think it was called Looking In from 8 to Midnight, although I'm terrible with numbers, so please don't hold that against me. I think it was around 8 to Midnight. It felt like that. I was the youngest guy in L.A. doing talk radio. And I was uh, playing music, but more and more leaning towards interviewing the people who made the music, who were making the news, who were writing the literature, who were painting the paintings, and walking the walk. I didn't have an agenda. It wasn't, hmm, it's, it's intriguing when you ask what was my intent? What was I trying to do? I think I was just trying to be real and provide a bridge for others, like-minded people, to hear stuff on the radio that they could not hear anywhere else. And in terms of the interview format, which eventually became my specialty, I learned to shut up. I learned to ask a question get out of the way and give the guest all the time in the world they needed to respond. Didn't care about white noise. The interview format eventually became my specialty. I worked in a half a dozen radio stations. Uh, strike the word work and insert the word play or be fortunate enough to have been on air at a half a dozen radio stations before it, uh, it ended. KPBC was really the heart of it. Um, that was a radio station in Pasadena, California, in the basement of a church. And I just wanted to keep it real. My wish was because suddenly so-called underground FM radio was becoming noticed and people were uh, attempting to copy it and they were talking about it. And I knew that as long as it was kept in kind of a, a contained environment, it's like a private club where you kind of know who's going to show up every night and you feel comfortable. And if you get too well known, or the club gets too well known, the place, the, you know, they tear down the walls, they make it larger, they let more people in, and eventually it becomes an auditorium and you lost your motivation for going there to begin with. So um, I don't think any of us who were on the air at that time ever did any publicity or promotion or try to get the LA Times to do a profile on what we were doing on the radio. We wanted to keep it small. Every time I sat down in front of a microphone on the radio in those years, I thought that I was talking to about 37 people in Topanga Canyon which is a small rural canyon right outside of Los Angeles. Uh, I assumed that um, at that hour they were extremely relaxed, possibly high, very comfortable, very attentive, and I wasn't background material. So I had a high responsibility to live up to. Every now and then I use phrases like indigenous subcultures and I'm sometimes asked to follow up on it. I scratch my head and said, what did I mean by that phrase? Um, what I meant was, you can't separate FM radio in the 60s from what was going on in the 60s. And the people who were making the 60s, the 60s. The radio was extraordinary, but so were the times. It was the most dramatic, compelling, and exciting time to be alive in America.
This is difficult to tell uh, to people who are 16, 17, 18, and 19 without sounding like their grandparents. But this was it. The mid-60s, this is when uh, music came alive. This is when um, it went from something in the background to something in the frontal lobes of your brain, touched your heart, moved you internally, and altered your world. This was a time that we probably had the, the largest amount of cultural upheaval, political change, alterations of perception, sexual mores, uh, you name it, and it changed in the 60s. And those who were born before the 60s and after the 60s were two different subcultures of people. The radio, the tribal drum, echoed those cultural differences. Uh, we were beating on tom-toms and saying, hello in there. Can you hear me? You're not crazy. It's okay to express yourself. It's okay to want to feel loved and to express love. In fact, it's okay to express almost anything. You can talk now. You can come outside. We can hold hands. We can dance. And we can do a thousand things that your parents said would be bad for you. They're not. And you can grow your hair long. Um, and basically, uh, there were no rules. It was not anarchy. It was not destructive. Uh, those times were the most peaceful that one could hope for and recall. Those were the times before people had electric gates on their doors and closed circuit cameras and when the most famous of rock stars could walk around the world without a posse of 11 bodyguards packing heat. Those were the times when you could just walk up to somebody after a show and shake their hand and say, that really sounded good without being tackled to the ground. The radio reflected that. Um, in a sense, it was a classless time, meaning uh, it didn't matter if there was a passenger train with first class seating in the front and the rest in the caboose, we were all in the same train together and we were all carrying the same luggage and we were also able to take the luggage and toss it out the window. I think that's what I meant by that indigenous subculture thing. Um, 